Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sonny Singera from uh, British Columbia. I'm with the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia. I'm the manager of road safety there, and I'm also the chair of the Road Safety Research and Policy Standing Committee. I will be your moderator for today's session. Uh, the following presentation will last about uh, one hour, uh, and it will co uh, conclude with uh, questions and answers. But in speaking with Catherine, uh, she's very much open to taking questions throughout the presentation and making it more of a discussion. So uh, she'll pause at certain slides to be able to open it up. The name of the presentation for today is Tomorrow's Mobility Landscape from Car and Ride Sharing to Autonomous Vehicles. And that's a, a theme that seems to be woven throughout a number of presentations that we've seen uh, today. To discuss the topic, we have Catherine Cargis, who's the Vice President at Marcon and current Chair of the Electric Mobility Canada. Catherine is a business strategist with 25 years of experience working with public and private organizations operating in the fields of transportation, energy, and financial services. At Marcon, she's responsible for directing and executing strategic consulting assignments for government and private clients. Catherine leads a group of North American organizations that are assessing the impact of the change in mobility and specifically autonomous vehicle technology on Canadians our businesses, our road infrastructure, and safety as well as government. Catherine holds a college degree with distinction in mathematics and social sciences, sciences from Marianapolis College, a Bachelor of Commerce degree with honors in marketing and international business from McGill University, as well as an MBA with honors in strategy from McGill University. She is an executive chartered business strategist. Please help me welcome Catherine Cargis. Thank you, Sunny. Um, like Sunny said, um, I would very much encourage you to uh, turn this into a discussion. So if you have any questions or you want to bring up anything, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, I will pause from time to time um, to check with you, but if, uh, if I don't pause at the right moment, you can, you know, raise your hand and I'll stop. So. How many of you have heard of peak car? None of you. Well, um, apparently, if you follow the statistics in uh, Western Europe, in North America, what we've been seeing for the last uh, few years, uh, even before the recession uh, and past the recession, is a decline in the vehicle miles traveled. In fact, in Western Europe, what we have seen is a decline in the number of vehicles that are being sold as well. There's, there's a reason why the Chinese market is of interest to auto manufacturers. Not only uh, are they a market where people are interested uh, in purchasing new vehicles, but it's also that much more interesting given the fact that their traditional markets, North America and particularly Western Europe, their sales are on the decline. And I want to bring up a few trends The condo to parking space ratios are on the decline. Even in Vancouver, th that is the case. In fact, in Vancouver, the regulations were changed. And um, in fact, all the municipalities around the city of uh, Vancouver are also changing those regulations, right? Because f f despite the fact that those condo spaces were available day in, day out, uh, they were not occupied. Younger people are obtaining their licenses later in life. Uh, it's the case uh, in North America. It's the case in uh, Europe as well. Um, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why this is happening. But not only are they delaying uh, the uh, obtaining a driver's license, many of them are getting into their 30s without a driver's license at all having decided to avoid one completely. We mentioned the overall miles driven being on the decline. Transit ridership is on the rise. Um, and this is, uh, in, this is to reflect 
to a large extent, uh, the large urbanization in this country, for example, CUDA's statistics indicate over the last few years, uh, transit ridership has increased twice as fast as the population. And that holds as well. Not only is it the case in Canada, but it's the case in the United States. It's the case in Europe as well. We have a declining percentage of eligible Canadians, Canadians who are eligible to drive, who are holding a, a driver's license. And we also have something really interesting, an aging population. Right now, about 15% of our population is senior citizens. Within a very short period, we're supposed to hit over 20% of our population being that way. I don't know why this is happening. And part of that aging population brings some very interesting challenges for people like yourselves. Those aging boomers According to our statistics, what we've seen is that there are approximately 120,000 people in this country today who hold a valid driver's license and who suffer from some form of dementia. Within about a decade, that number will more than double. So as a society, we have a challenge. We're going to need to be able to determine how we're going to continue to meet the mobility needs of an aging population without putting the rest of the motorists and pedestrians at risk. So what's causing some of these uh, declines? Cost of ownership is a really big one. The Canadian Automobile Association estimates that for uh, usage of about 18,000 kilometers per year, a very average vehicle is going to run a Canadian anywhere in the neighborhood of 10 to $15,000 after tax, depending on their age and where in the country they live. That's a lot of money. In fact, for the majority of Canadians, it's their single largest expense. We're not talking about the, their home because the home is actually an investment, right? If you buy a vehicle, the moment you drive it off the lot, you've just lost 30 to 35% of the value of the vehicle. Parking. Have you ever tried to park in one of the cities in this country? I mean, I don't think I've found anything cheaper than $20 to park for a day. I was in Calgary a few weeks ago to park a vehicle there. I mean, I don't know if I was in the wrong neighborhood, but they were asking for And of course, if you own your vehicle and you happen to live in a condo, you also have to buy the condo, uh, the, the spot for, to, to house that vehicle. That vehicle, which by the way, sits idle over 90% of the day, right? And of course, there's traffic. If you were driving into, into th this hotel today, you would swear that you were spending way too much time in your vehicle. Right? And it's increasingly an issue. And Torontonians, just like many Canadians across the country, are realizing that they don't want to sit in traffic. So we're seeing an increasing number of uh, people who are moving back into the cities. And Toronto is a prime example. And of course, we have health concerns, right? I mean, we're 
pretty immobile most of the time. Uh, young people are saying, well, you know, I, I could pretty much take the bus and run around and uh, run my errands and maybe do a little bit of walking, get some exercise in there. Um, why do I have to sit behind a desk all day and then sit in my car all, all, all the way to, to, to get home? There are environmental concerns for the obvious reasons. Telecommuting is a biggie. Increasingly, we're seeing uh, in, uh, in the United States and here in Canada, it's picking up as a trend where people have decided to, you know, work a day a week from home. So I don't really need to have that vehicle for that day of the week. Or maybe I can make it two days a week that I'm going to work from home. Home entertainment. Who goes to the movie theater anymore? Right? I mean, as long as you've got Netflix, hey, you know, I mean, why would we be uh, driving to the movie theater? And of course, there's social networking. There are people who believe that as long as I can connect with my friends on Facebook or Twitter or... I apologize for this. Why would I need to go out and see them? It's the same thing. There was actually a study undertaken uh, by the University of Michigan which indicated that people in their 20s actually consider social networking being exactly the same thing as connecting, excuse me, is there something, how, some way I can get rid of this? And then of course the mobility options which we're gonna talk about now. And part of those mobility options have to do with what's being referred to as the sharing economy where we're sharing everything uh, from uh, uh, our homes to act as hotel rooms for people who are on Airbnb, our vehicles who are, that are being used for ride-sharing purposes. And we're having a huge number of changes in mobility. Car sharing is one of them. In fact, we have how many would like to hazard a guess? How many members do you think we have of car sharing in Canada? No guess? I have a guess. Yes? 10,000? 150,000 people wow. are already car sharing members in this country. And that number is expected to grow at least sixfold by, the, by 2020. No, car sharing is actually services like Zipcar, uh, Car2Go, um, those kinds of services, right? And actually, it's a, it's a growing trend that's taking off. As you can see in North America and Europe, it's growing like the gangbusters. And there are numerous benefits to car sharing, right? So. What we're seeing is that one shared vehicle can actually replace up to 20 individually owned vehicles. That's huge. And it has tremendous implications for a number of industries. In the United States, there was a study that was undertaken uh, at the beginning of this year that concluded that there were 500,000 vehicles that were not sold because people had access to car sharing. And that's only going to grow. Car2Go is introducing uh, new cities where they are going to be active in Canada and elsewhere almost on a monthly basis. They are introducing new vehicles into their fleets. Many of them are electric vehicles. And actually Vancouver happens to be the crown city for car to go. That's where their headquarters are, right? This is an example of the experience in France. 
So this, they took uh, the population that was using car sharing and compared them before and after they became members of the car sharing club. So we went from 39% who didn't have a vehicle to 78% who didn't have a vehicle. We went from 50% who owned one vehicle to 18% who owned a vehicle. And 11% that owned two or more to just 4%. All because they realized that they could have a vehicle when they needed one and only when they needed one. So, because the auto manufacturers are seeing the trends and the writing on the wall, they have decided to vertically integrate forward into the space of sharing vehicles. And that's why BMW is there through their program called Drive Now. That's why Daimler is there with car to go that's why Toyota is in the car sharing business. That's why Renault is in the car sharing business. Nissan is there as well. And it's not limited to individual car sharing. In Europe, we're seeing increasingly that there are corporations and go both gov uh, public and private organizations that are moving to something called mobility allowances. How many of you he have heard of this? No. Okay, so what's a mobility allowance? Instead of uh, you working for... Hmm. Instead of... Um, you working for a specific corporation and being uh, allocated a vehicle, you're told you get X amount of money, which is an allowance, and you use that money in order to be able to get around to see clients, see uh, suppliers, and so on and so forth. And you use that money in order to uh, share, uh, use car sharing services, to use the train, to use ride sharing services, to use whatever is required to get around. There are already over 2,000 vehicles in Europe that are involved in these types of corporate car sharing uh, schemes. They're expected to grow by a hundredfold before the end of the decade. And this is the trend. Actually, last year, the US government put out a, a request for uh, services. Uh, and the request was to replace the entire government fleet with a sharing fleet. How long before the Canadian government does that? And then there's ride sharing. In the United States, they come under the term of transportation network companies. And when I talk about these, what am I referring to? I'm referring to companies like uh, Sidecar, Lyft, Uber, I don't know how many of you are familiar with them, right? So what is ride sharing? Ride sharing is I own my vehicle and I am deciding to work with Uber, for example, and I become an Uber driver. I turn on my Uber app and I can see who requires a ride in my area. Okay, and I can accept to take that person to the place that they are interested in getting to. I pick, as soon as I accept, that passenger, my next ride, can actually follow me on his or her smartphone and watch me as I approach him or her. It's not a taxi. I cannot turn on a meter as soon as I get there. 
But the person who has, the, uh, who has requested this ride already knows how much he or she is expected to pay in advance. And it's called a donation. It's a suggested donation, okay? Because if we were to put a meter, we would become a taxi. And once this, the ride has taken place, and there's been an exchange of money that has taken place, I, as the motorist, the person driving, am able, I, what I do is I have the opportunity to rate my rider on the app. And I can say, great payer, you know, instead of giving the suggested nine, you know, like actually gave me 10, whatever it was, pleasant company in the car and so on and so forth. And the rider gets to do exactly the same thing as far as the, the driver is concerned. So that the next time that somebody is interested in requesting a ride and they see my profile and they don't like it, they're not going to request me. They're going to request somebody else. So I have every interest in being a nice driver. Yes? You could be a taxi driver and be a serial killer too if you wanted to, right? Um, and actually you bring up an excellent point because the point you just brought up has been brought up by many, many regulators in the United States, has been brought up by taxi companies in the United States. Sorry about that. And one of the issues that has also been brought up is insurance. Who actually pays if something goes wrong? And this whole thing actually took on a life of its own earlier this year, actually just after New Year's. Um, there was an Uber driver driving in San Francisco who um, happened to hit a little girl, a six-year-old, and that little girl was killed. So the parents of the little girl ended up suing not the driver, but Uber, the company saying that the mother said that I clearly saw that the driver was looking down at his app when he hit my kid. So despite the fact that he had nobody sitting in the vehicle, he was not generating revenue when he hit that child, uh, who was actually responsible? And so now obviously it's in the courts. I don't know how it's going to end up. Um, Uber is claiming that it, was, it wasn't their responsibility. But since then, what they have done is they have introduced um, insurance, additional insurance, whereby as soon as the driver turns on his or her app that and, and is actively looking for a ride, um, he or she is covered not only by uh, their personal insurance, but is backed up by an insurance by Uber, right? Now, the insurance companies in the United States have raised their red flag and said, well, hold on a minute. If you're earning revenue while driving this vehicle, uh, you then require commercial insurance because personal insurance just isn't going to cut it. So this hasn't been settled. Actually, the interesting part is that each and every state is um, regulating this in a different manner. So the laws that apply in Colorado, for example, are not the laws that are applying in California, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't know when Canadian regulators are going to do something about this or introduce what we're going to do about this. Any other questions or comments? No? OK. So these are all iPhone apps of rideshare companies that are active in uh, North America. 
maybe not in all locations across North America, but certainly some are here in, in Toronto and other cities. And the, like I mentioned, the most important ones in North America are Lyft, Sidecar, and Uber. There we go. How many of you know who owns Uber? Hmm. Uber is owned by Google. Yes, yes, right? Yeah. So Uber is owned by Google. Actually, Google bought them last year for $258 million. Do you know what the valuation of this company is today? Do you want to hazard a guess? $10 billion. And what are they expecting? Well, every indication is that Google expects to use their Google cars in the Uber fleet. Okay, so this is where we're headed. So there's a convergence, right? There's a convergence between socio-demographics, what the millennials are seeking, what the aging population is forcing us into, what business models are looking towards, and what technology is permitting us to do. And all of this is converging onto the driverless car. So what can we expect in terms of adoption? Morgan Stanley came out with a report earlier this year, and this comes from the Morgan Stanley report. And based on their research, they're claiming that in 2018, we will have complete autonomous capability. Okay? And that from that point on, within two decades, we will have 100% autonomous penetration. They call this the utopian society. Yes? What are they uh, predicting? What are they looking at in terms of moving from the actual load that the car is using? Well, that's... A, th th that's Mm -hmm. Well, technology is changing at such a rapid pace, um, and it really does depend on the type of uh, driverless technology that we're talking about. There are organizations that are working on this technology today that are doing this assuming that infrastructure will never have to change. And there are other manufacturers who are assuming that we will have to change infrastructure a little bit. So, two examples. Google, for example, is moving forward assuming that we're not changing infrastructure. What they're doing is they are building out incredibly detailed maps at a pace that I can't even begin to describe. Um, and certainly, they do have the funds to do it, right? Um, there are or companies like Volvo, for example, that are assuming that we're going to have to change infrastructure a little bit in order to be able to make this level of penetration happen. Now, the big difficulty for many of them is not the end game where all vehicles are going to be completely driverless. The difficulty for many of them is this hybrid period where these driverless vehicles are going to have to coexist with conventional vehicles. And to a large extent, this is where Canadian regulations are going to have to, you know, we are going to need to plan appropriately and make sure that we're 
prepared for when this technology is ready to hit our roads. There are, um, the Department of Motor Vehicles in uh, California has already released uh, its um, roads, uh, rules of the road for uh, granting licenses to, dri uh, to driverless vehicles. But this is for testing purposes, so that exists. By January 2015, the same regulations for a commercially available driverless vehicle will also be released in California. In a related question, uh, people still have driver's license because of car share uh, vehicle companies, they drive once a month. Um, have any studies been done to estimate what the rate of people not having any driver's license at all will be in 10 years when, uh, and all the revenue that the governments make with those licensing fees for everybody? Is there well, any there studies was, out I, there? The, clearly there's going to be an impact, right? And um, th that study has, what you're referring to, has not been undertaken as far as I know. What was undertaken uh, was a brief study uh, recently, and I actually saw it last week, where the, um, the it, it was estimated that in the United States, if we took all of the uh, driving infractions and what they brought in in terms of revenue for the state, right, uh, and divided them by uh, the number uh, of, um, of drivers, we ended up with about, uh, not drivers, divided them by the number of police officers, we ended up with $300,000 of infractions per police officer. What happens when the driverless vehicle doesn't break the laws? Where does the state pick up that $300,000 per officer? Yes, yes, definitely. Oh, there are savings. There are definitely savings, right? And there's numerous benefits. Some, you know, safety is one of them. What, we lose 2,200 lives a year in Canada? At practically every year? It's on the decline, but there's still an important number of Canadians who lose their lives. It's the one, number one killer of young Canadians. And multitudes more that are injured every year. Oh, by the way, worldwide, I mean, we're very fortunate in this country. Worldwide, there are 1.2 to 1.3 million people who lose their lives every year because of these vehicles. That's a lot of people. Circulation. We were talking about infrastructure just a few minutes ago. There was a study that was undertaken by Columbia University uh, maybe 18 months ago. And the conclusion was that if we were to move to driverless vehicles, we could more than double the capacity of our existing highway infrastructure. I mean, think about it. If you take an aerial shot of any one of our highways, what are you going to see? the large majority of what you're going to see is pavement. Why? Because as drivers, as motorists, as people who make mistakes, we tend to leave a fair distance be ahead, behind, on either side in order to ensure that no collisions take place. Assume that we're working with driverless vehicles and these vehicles don't apply makeup, they don't, uh, they, they don't eat, 
they don't, you know, they don't listen, you know, they, they're not having an argument with their boyfriend while they're in the vehicle driving. They don't do a lot of the things that humans do, right? Yes. Oh. Maybe I agree with you. I, what you're just describing is Canada, right? Um, potholes, uh, ice, uh, extreme weather conditions almost half the year. Um, and to be honest, weather is one of the last technical challenges that these vehicles face. And it's not a nut that they have cracked very well yet. They're in the process of doing so, but they haven't cracked it very well yet. And we're going to get soon, I'm going to mention a project that is being done in Sweden to help get around what you're talking about. Yes. The project that you're going to talk about may be the same one I'm thinking of. It's um, Intelligent Roads. So it's the idea of replace the asphalt tech, um, infrastructure with a solar panel infrastructure that just deals with so many things. It allows you to, to um, it'll do the, generate the electricity to clear the ice and snow and sleet, so keep your roads, your roads safe that way. Um, the estimate is that if all the roads in the US were replaced with these intelligent roads, the U.S. would generate three times the power that it uses, um, and it deals with water collection, all kinds of things. And if, if you combine those two um, technologies, so you had intelligent roads and intelligent vehicles, it seems like potentially limitless possibilities. There are an incredible number of options that can be explored. Unfortunately, many governments are, you have to have a vision in order to be able to do this, right? And not too many of our governments have that vision. Um, secondly, it requires investment. And most of our governments are cash poor, right? I don't know any of the governments in Canada that are, willing, that are on a spending spree these days, right? At any level. So, Clearly, there are benefits with respect to safety. I didn't say that 93% of collisions are caused by human error, right? But they are. So another benefit is environmental, from an environmental perspective. If any of you are involved in insurance, you know that greenhouse gas emissions are a major bugger for the insurance industry. Right? We've had uh, catastrophes, weather-related catastrophes in this country that are presenting themselves at a more frequent rate. It is costing insurance companies an incredible amount of money, billions of dollars in this country alone. So there is a cost associated with this. By moving to a technology, a smarter driving technology, we are able to uh, waste less fuel. Uh, I mean, I read a statistic, and I may be, I, I, I think it was 
close to 30% of the fuel that we consume that is wasted sitting in traffic or looking for a parking spot. What if our vehicles were intelligent enough to be able to identify the most uh, fuel efficient route to get to wherever we want to get to? What if these driverless vehicles were shared vehicles and therefore never needed to look for a parking space anyways, because as soon as they would drop us off, they would move on to the next uh, user? And of course, productivity. In some of the large cities in North America, we spend the equivalent of 32 working days per year sitting in traffic. What could you do with another 32 days a year? We were talking about savings. The same Morgan Stanley report estimates that in the United States, these driverless vehicles would save the US $1.3 trillion dollars annually. If we were to take this purely on a per capita basis and try to do the same thing for Canada, we, we come to a savings of about $145 billion annually. And this comes from a variety of sources, whether it be uh, fuel savings, uh, avoided accidents and their related costs, uh, savings from just sitting in congestion, productivity gains, all of this added together in the United States is estimated to be worth $1.3 billion trillion dollars annually. That's a huge number. But as many of you have pointed out up until now, this technology isn't only accompanied by savings. It will be accompanied by a reduction in revenues. And it's not going to happen overnight. Clearly, there are semi-autonomous uh, technologies that are being legislated uh, in, around the world, whether we're talking about Europe, the United States, Asia. We're talking about a variety of technologies that are being legislated at various points in time. And we all, so we had the arrival of the first semi-autonomous vehicle in 2013. Did any of you see it? It's the Mercedes S550. Have any of you tried it? When if you get a chance, you should try it. On my to-do list. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well. If you, if you show up at Electric Mobility Canada's conference in October, the vehicle may prob will probably be there, the updated version of it. So what I've presented here is <clears throat> the, from Statistics Canada, this dates back to 2010, the age of our fleet in Canada. And the average age was 8.6 years. And 35% of our vehicles on the road were less than five years old. So what are we talking about? We're talking about as we move forward, whether we like to be able to address the challenges that are going to be in front of us, we're going to have to deal with a mixed fleet. And that is where your challenge is going to be the greatest. It's not when everything turns into an autonomous vehicle. It's what happens while the autonomous vehicle shares the road with a conventional vehicle. So how are Canadians thinking about driverless technology. My firm did a study uh, last year, in May of last year, 
and we asked Canadians how many of them would be interested in moving to a fully driverless vehicle, give, give up their own vehicle and move to a fully driverless vehicle if one was commercially available. And as you can see, one out of every seven Canadians said today, or last year, they would be very comfortable doing so. And another 47% said, somewhat comfortable. What I found really interesting when looking at the results was that those numbers were higher among parents than they were among those who don't have children. And when we dug into those numbers, one of the things that they were thinking about was convenience. I don't have to keep dri driving the kids around all the time. Yes. When you're talking about drivers, are you still talking about a driver being in the car? No. No. No driver. Driver less. Yes. So so a situation then where you don't have somebody that can override the function of the car if something happens. Some extraordinary situation happens. Because you know, part of the issue is being able to address what Training a driver of a driverless car would need to have. Well, you're absolutely right. So, you know, one of the things that um, is being discussed over and over and over again is uh, liability associated with these vehicles. Who's going to be responsible when that collision takes place? And it will take place. No manufacturer, no developer of this technology is denying that if, if something is going to happen at some point. So who's going to be responsible? Is it going to be the, you know, I don't know, the 75-year-old woman who's sitting there being taken to her, uh, to her doctor's appointment? Is that logical? And then there are people who are studying this, including the, uh, the Brookings Institute, and despite the fact that they have an incredible reputation, um, I, with all due respect, will um, say that their, their comments on this particular area are completely false. They stated earlier this year, based on their evaluation of the situation, that, you know, why are we making such a big fuss about this? We shouldn't be making a big fuss about it because there are already laws that govern product liability. And so if something goes wrong, it will be those same laws that will apply to the driverless vehicles. Well, you know what? This isn't a blender. This has the potential to hurt someone very seriously. It has the potential to end a person's life if something goes wrong. So, should we expect our current product liability laws to come into play and regulate this? I don't think so. I think we need as a society and as government to seriously consider what we're going to ask of the organizations that are going to put these vehicles on the road. Do you see, do you see a greater uptake of driverless vehicles inside a heavily urbanized and heavily populated center versus in rural areas? Uh, what? Uh, yes. Yes. So
clearly, um, urban setting driving is a lot more challenging than um, th th than driving in an uh, in a rural setting, right? Because of the number of unpredictable things that can happen, a kid's ball that falls in, out in front of you, um, uh, the construction issues that are taking place at just about every corner. I mean, just look in this city, for example. Um, so it has been a greater challenge for the developers of this technology to get the urban driving part down pat. I don't know if you were following the news over the last few weeks, but Google announced that they, they put up a video on their, uh, on their blog. Um, there was a big deal being made in the media about their vehicle actually being able to drive well uh, in an urban setting. Because the urban setting is a lot more challenging than the rural setting. Having said that, Having said that, most organizations that I'm familiar with are planning to do exactly what you said, to start off with the, uh, the urban environments and to probably spread out. Because the challenges and the issues that are being faced and the reasons why driverless vehicles are making a lot more sense are much more present in our urban environments than in our rural environments. This is another study done by Cisco at about the same time as we did ours. And they did this in a number of countries. We only did it in Canada. And the Canadian numbers indicate that 52% of consumers would trust driverless vehicles. This is last year. Since then, uh, again, this is May 2013, as exactly the same time as ours. Um, since then, the technology has been discussed much more in the last year than in the two, three years before that. Um, and consumers are getting increasingly more comfortable with it. So if we were to run this study today, I don't know what the numbers would be. I would hazard a guess that they would be higher. How many of you are familiar with NHTSA's uh, five levels of automation? No? OK. Well, NHTSA last year came out with their five levels of automation. Zero is no automation whatsoever. Level one is the function-specific automation, where you know, it involves one or more specific controls. Level two is that Mercedes that, that, I was, uh, that I was talking about, which is the combined function automation, which is at least two primary controls. Are we doing OK on time? Getting close to 530. Okay. Just gonna say about All right. 10 more okay. Minutes, so, so we're, we're going to go faster. And then the Google car, which is considered to be a level three, and then level four, which is fully autonomous. Okay. If we are to take what I showed you earlier, which is the, the graph of um, where we're, the, the age of our vehicles in Canada, and I plotted over it where we could be in 2024, 10 years into the future, okay? So assuming the technology is actually going to be commercially available around when Google, Nissan, Mercedes, everybody else is talking about, which is the end of this decade or 2020. So four years after the commercial availability of fully driverless vehicles, and assuming that these driverless vehicles are commercially available in shared fleets, and again, there are a number of issues that were, were uh, in, in, uh, in, um, hypotheses that were taken into consideration. We assumed that anywhere between 10 and 20% of the vehicles on our roads in 10 years from now would be driverless vehicles. 20 to 50% would be those level threes. 10 to 40% would be level twos. And then, of course, there will always be people who will want to hold on 
to, you know, their 1960s, you know, classics, right? But there are commercially available autonomous vehicles today, right? Fully driverless vehicles. This is the first one. It's manufactured by a French company called Induct. The, uh, the, uh, the car is a Navia. It is being used in um, off-road applications, in pedestrian walkways, in university campuses, in hospital campuses, in areas, uh, you know, amusement parks, in a variety of areas in Europe, in South America, in the United States. The U.S. Army is using uh, some of these. And so this vehicle will only go up to 20 kilometers an hour. It has sensors, no steering wheel. Uh, it is being, as you can see, used by, a ver uh, by several people. I don't know what their capacity is. So somebody said, only 20 kilometers an hour? And the company owner, Pierre Lefebvre, said, hey, if you can go at 20 kilometers an hour in Paris, you're really lucky. This is an example of a project that is being undertaken in the United Kingdom. Milton Keynes is an area where they're uh, taking about 100 electric driverless pods and they're applying them to an urban area, an urban center area. Um, and essentially, it's, it's a pedestrian area. What you're going to be able to do is call it on your cell phone and it w you will be able to use it, and it is essentially a taxi ride that costs you the same price as a bus ride. So between now and 2017, this project is going to be run. They're looking at the business model behind it. They're trying to see how it's going to all happen. Um, they're all low-speed vehicles. Uh, actually less than the induct. Oh, yeah. Um, and this is one of the biggest applications that is taking place in the world. Yes. No, this is, these are p uh, urban center pedestrian areas, right? So th they're actually connecting people from the city cores to, to the train stations. So you won't need to have a vehicle, right? This is the project that I was referring to, the infrastructure project. This is a project by Volvo in Sweden, in Gothenburg to be specific, um, called Dr Drive Me. Uh, there are about 100 of these vehicles that are already starting to populate the area. And what they're using, they're actually using magnets to keep self-driving cars on the road. It's a rather inexpensive, way to do this but you know Sweden has similar climatic conditions to Canada's where you know severe uh, snow uh, conditions and they are thinking that these magnets are going to do the job for them so there are ways and there are projects that are being looked at right now to address issues that uh, you you brought up earlier so there's clearly a lot of change ahead a significant reduction in the number of collisions, that is going to have a huge implications for the insurance industry in this country. I don't know if the rest of you have, have calculated this, but we're talking about in excess of $19 billion worth of pre uh, insurance premiums annually. 60% of it go through the broker channel. How many broker mom and pop shops, you know, define their business model by the home and auto insurance? There's already been a huge increase in consolidation, both on the carrier and the broker side, and it will clearly increase, and this is just going to be a pre precipitating factor. Mm -hmm. It's a significant uh, aftermarket part yes. uh, for repairs. So, yeah. 
I mean, in a, in a province like Ontario, where auto fraud is, you know, estimated to be anywhere between one and two billion dollars, I think that the number was 900 million to 1.8 billion dollars annually. Actually, these, th this type of information, j just even when it's a driverless vehicle that comes into uh, having a collision with a conventional vehicle, um, that, I mean, j just the information that is being collected by these vehicles is going to be enough to help us eliminate issues of fraud. Right? I mean, the Google car, just to give you a, 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 a quick bit of information, the Google car collects almost one gigabyte of data per second. That's how much information is being, is being seized of everything that is seized around it. And then the other thing, we're going to have to start treating this as, you know, we're moving from ensuring a driver, uh, the, uh, ensuring a driver to ensuring a passenger. It is going to be the user of the blender, essentially. And that has huge implications as well. So what does it mean in, as far as our infrastructure is concerned? Are we going to have to start putting magnets in our roads? Are we going to, how are we going to make sure that these vehicles are integrated in Canada's transportation network? Are we going to set aside um, lanes specifically for driverless vehicles? Is it going to be necessary? Are we going to have motorists who are going to go out of their way to do strange things to the driverless vehicle just because it's a driverless vehicle and they don't want it on the road? So is this what we're going to have to do? And regulations. I mentioned about California. In Canada, I mean, we haven't, we haven't really done anything. We have not only California, but Nevada, Michigan, Florida, the District of Columbia. These are all areas in the United States that have already passed uh, legislation to allow for at least the testing of these vehicles to take place. We have one of the leading manufacturers or developers of this technology in this country located just outside Ottawa. The company is called QNX. They cannot test the vehicles in Canada. They have to fly the vehicles to Nevada to be able to test them. It doesn't make any sense. We will have to have these vehicles here anyways. So we can either benefit from the economic opportunities that the development of this technology will afford us, or we will become importers of this technology once again. But in order to allow companies like QNX to do their work and do the testing in Canada, we're going to have to change our regulations. Yes. So these are, you know, a lot of short-term integration, how we're going to do it. And eventually, we're, what we're going to also have to think about is who owns the data that these vehicles are going to be collecting. Data is going to be worth a lot of money. Who owns that data? <coughs> who can access the data? And who can use it and how? And this is something that is going to be imperative for government in this country to be able to define. So I know my time is up. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to stick around and answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine. That was a very insightful presentation. It certainly gives us uh, a lot of thought uh, to what's happening in the, in the very near future in terms of road transportation. So we do welcome having you coming to uh, CCMTA to share that. Uh, as a thank you, 
Uh, we have a, a little gift oh, from CCMTA, so, so our much. appreciation. Please accept that. Uh, so for the rest of the, the day for uh, attendees, uh, just be reminded that we do have the welcoming reception that's taking place uh, across the street, and that's at the Canadian Opera Company, and that will be happening at 6.30. So thank you, and uh, I'd encourage you to seek out Catherine if you do have any other questions to follow up on that presentation.